Hi again, I'm Christy Wendelberger from the research director at the Southeast Organic Center. Um, we are based in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia. Um, if you aren't familiar with us, we are a fairly new resource center at Rodale. And we started in 2019 and really got on the ground in 2020. Um, and the presentation that I'm giving today is one of our first research projects that we installed um, starting in the fall of 2020. So um, we have the preliminary data for it and just kind of give you some background on what we're thinking and why we're doing it um, and some history of, of the Southeast for those who aren't so familiar. Um, so before I really get started, I want to do some housekeeping. Um, please check that you can hear me. And if you cannot hear me, then check your audio, um, click on the audio and, uh, um, and just check to see um, that's on your screen and, and try to work that out. Um, there's for questions and answers, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q&A button on your screen during the presentation if you have any questions that come up and I will answer those questions um, at the end of the presentation. Please do not use the chat for the Q&A. Um, the chat is, it just kind of gets cumbersome after a while and it's a little, and so it's just easier and, um, and things flow better if you put everything into the Q&A button. Um, for all other problems, if you just can't get on and you don't know um, uh, you don't know what you what you're doing wrong. You can call Maria Pop, our education director, and her phone number is 610-683-1481. Um, please write that down because um, just in case you have any problems during the presentation. Um, and this recording is um, the presentation will be recorded and it's going to be posted on our website in about a week. So you'll be able to view it again if you want to. And I'm just gonna check in the chat real quick just to see um, if there was any questions. Um, I just see a lot of people saying hi. So if you wanna chat amongst yourselves, please do feel free. But again, if you have any questions for me, put it into the Q&A button. All right, so we will get started. I want to thank our funders before um, before we really even begin um, the we, this project um, uh, diversifying inputs in the southeastern soils is a joint collaborative project with um, be, between the Rodale Institute Southeast Greenwich Center and Clemson University um, and it's funded mainly through the USDA NIFA Organic Transitions Program and of course many supporters of Rodale and the Southeast Organic Center. Center. So please thank, thank you to everyone who has made the work possible and to help us really get started um, as a research and resource center here in the Southeast. So I'll just go over what we're going to what we're going to accomplish today. Um, I'm going to talk about a brief geological history of the southeastern Piedmont and the coastal plain, just to give everybody a little background on why we would be doing a collaborative dual project with Clemson um, and the Southeast Organic Center. What we know about how to improve soil health already, um, because we already know a lot, um, but if you know what we know, then we can kind of go backwards then and figure out what we don't know so that we can answer good questions. Uh, the overall research questions that we came up with um, for this experiment, go over the experimental design so everybody knows what we're doing, and then um, the initial soil analysis across both research sites, just to be able to kind of give a comparison for what we were beginning with at each of the research sites. Work to date, um, just up to the latest that we have done on the project. 
and then analyses on cover crop biomass and tomato yields, which is their preliminary work and preliminary analyses, just kind of getting things started and really looking at what we have, um, what we've already started to collect. And then at the end, again, there'll be the question and answer session where um, I will um, I will open it up and answer questions in the in the Q and A button um, button. So the southeast is um, very is it's very um, um, dominated by the Piedmont and the coastal plain. And the, these soils are really, you know, like any, any soils really are very um, driven by the geological processes that happened prior to us, right? So millions of years ago. Um, if you look right here, you can see along this black line, I hope you can see my cursor, the black line that um, divides the Piedmont and the coastal plain along um, the Atlantic plain. This black line is actually um, is called the fall line. And we are located here, the SOC is located here in the Piedmont and the um, PD research, the Clemson University PD Re Research Center is located here in um, the coastal plain in South Carolina. So the fall line um, is really, as I said, it divides the Piedmont from the, um, from the coastal plain. And this line goes across all the way through um, the United States up into Maryland. Um, it's, and it is, it's an actual geologic boundary. It's about 20 miles wide. Um, it's called the fall line because it's a rapid loss of elevation right within those 20 miles that creates this line of rapids throughout the area. Um, the thing that's significant about this is that during the Mesozoic era, it was actually the shoreline of the Atlantic Ocean. So if you can imagine that if this is the shoreline, then everything south of that line is, um, is mostly sediments, sand sediments and deposits, while everything north of that line is um, our minerals that are that came down from the decomposition of the Appalachian Mountains. So what that does is it creates this divide where there is a lot of clay north clay soils north of the line and there are a lot of sandy soils south of the fall line. So just from a natural perspective and just what vegetation would naturally be on the on the, the ground and how it's divided, when you are north of the fall line and in the Piedmont, you will, again, you'll see clay soils as opposed to the sandy soils of the coastal plain. Um, in the Piedmont, the rivers tend to be really narrow um, valleys while in the coastal plain, there are wide floodplains, which you can picture how that would change the way the hydrological pattern is happening and the way you would manage your soils or your farms based off of which, whether you're in the Piedmont or the coastal plain. Um, there's deciduous hardwood forest, oaks and hickory in the Piedmont, while the coastal plain is longleaf pine forest, swamp forest and tidal marshes. And again, those different vegetation types are gonna create more acid soil versus um, more basic soil. And it'll change the way the soil composition um, is generated over time. And then just an interesting tidbit is that the um, in the Piedmont, it shares a lot of the same bird populations as those northern regions north of the Piedmont and again, of course, north of the fall line. While the coastal plain is dominated by wetland birds and waterfowl that are not found so much north of the line. So it really is a very geographic, um, geologic divide right here in the southeast. 
some of the commonalities between the coastal plain and the Piedmont is degraded soils. So um, uh, the climate here gets very hot um, and there's a lot of rainfall. We can get up to 50 inches or more of rain depending on the weather fronts that come through. And for those of you who live in this area, you might remember this past summer, we had three high rain events that came through every, it was, it was almost every two weeks where we just kept having these recurrent high rainfall events. So um, that is possible and that can lead to um, leaching of soil nutrients, um, intensive tillage over time from historic practices during, you know, the cotton era and um, other just, you know, poor for farming practices have led to erosion and low soil um, organic carbon, low soil fertility and poor soil structure within both the Piedmont and the coastal plain. So we already know a lot about how to improve soil health. Um, so some of the ways are to use conservation tillage or no-till and um, con versus conventional tillage. So instead of with conventional tillage, it um, you, you plow deep into the soil and that breaks up the microbial communities there. It breaks up the microhabitat within the soil, bringing in more oxygen, drying out the soil, um, increasing the temperatures of the soil. And it just changes the entire microenvironment within the soil layer, which will impact the microbial community. Um, it allows for, um, for gas release of nitrous oxides and um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And, um, and so, you know, con the conventional tillage can be, is very detrimental. It, it creates erosion and, and other um, nutrient runoff issues where with conservation tillage or no till, then you are either not tilling the ground at all, or you're doing something that's similar to what you see here on this screen, um, which is a, is a form of reduced till or strip till. Um, where all we did was till just in the very area that we are going to plant our crop and left the, the native community in between. And for weeding, we would just mow the grass in between and hand, hand, hand manage the um, weeds that are within the lines. We also know that using cover crops is really good for soil health. Um, it rebuilds soil organic matter just by putting, it, especially when you leave the residue on the land, um, it helps, you, it will incorporate over time by the microbes in the soil and increase the soil organic matter. It increases aeration by putting roots into the ground and those roots will form little tunnels through the ground, which brings air from the top of the soil layer down to, into the um, into the soil strata. It increases compaction um, by the, again with the um, with the root system going down into the soil. It breaks up this compacted soil and um, helps release some of that. It increases infiltration because again with the roots that goes down creates these little tunnels. And then when those roots die, it leaves those little tunneling the tunneling behind. And if you don't till then that tunneling system is there. So when it rains, it allows water to just go right into the soil as opposed to running off. It helps with water retention. Um, if you leave your, your um, cover crop on the ground, like the residue on the ground, like you can see in this picture, then you it makes the soil cooler. It protects it from evaporation. Um, and again, it just protects that micro environment that keeps water in the ground and, and can make it so you have to use less water over time. And then it improves the soil microbial community, as I said, by creating a microhabitat. Um, those tunnels bring oxygen. There's exudates from the, the cover crop that feed the microbial community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, um, and so it just helps support the entire microbial community.
We also know that adding organic amendments is really good for the soil. It helps increase the soil organic carbon. And again, with that whole process of feeding the microbial community, helping soils to aggregate, helping soils to become more stable. But what we don't know, and the reason we worked on this project is how exactly do all of these components intersect across the Piedmont and the coastal plain to improve soil health. So, um, you know, do you, if you have a cover crop, do you have to do a reduced till? If you have a cover crop, do you, do, is it better to add manure? Or um, if you aren't using a cover crop, then is manure enough? And, um, and how is that, how does that happen in Piedmont soils versus coastal plain soils? So we put this project together and came up with some questions. Um, how do, um, the first question is how do diversifying organic inputs interact with tillage affecting um, soil microbial diversity, soil organic, um, um, organic carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus cycling in the Piedmont and coastal plain? And what are the impacts of diversified organic inputs and tillage on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus biogeochemical processes? Um, and what are the short-term changes in soil health? Because this project is a three-year project. So we're not gonna learn what's gonna happen in 10 years from this project, but we will have learn what can you do in your soil um, in three years that could improve the soil health and what, what techniques um, will improve your soil health and, and help you out um, in the immediate future. And how does diversified management influence nutritional quality and yields of vegetables? So I got, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're still gathering data for this project. And so I'm going to later present um, data on the yields and the biomass from the uh, first round of cover crops that we got. Our treatments, we had tilling methods, which was the conservation and the conventional tillage that you saw in that previous picture where it was the, the, the um, form of strip till and then just your regular conservation deep plow. Cover crops, um, we used hairy vetch and cereal rye, and then we used chicken manure for compost. The experimental design, it's a randomized split block design. Um, there are a total of eight blocks. Four blocks are conventional tillage, four blocks are conservation tillage. And then within each of the blocks, there are eight 18 by 20 plots. And those plots are divided by a control, which has no cover crop, no manure, um, a rye and vetch cover crop mix, a vetch and manure mix, a rot, just rye, just vetch, rye, vetch, and manure combined, just manure and rye and manure. So with these eight plots and eight of those in each of the eight blocks, you end up with 64 plots and four replicates of each one of them under the different tillage types. So we took initial soil samples in the beginning before we even broke the field um, because in our, in our site at the SOC, the, it was an open pasture and we had to, we were breaking the field for the first time in order to, um, to get this experiment going. Um, and then Clemson also took initial data where they are looking at, um, they're looking at their soils and what they are starting with. So I'll just go over some of what we saw um, in, through that data. So we found that not unexpectedly, the coastal plain where Clemson is has 80%, um, about 80% sand, almost no clay and um, a little bit of silt. And in, um, conversely, in the Piedmont soils where the Southeast Organic Center is, we had um, about 60% sand, so about 20% less sand than the coastal plain, and about a little over 10% um, clay. So we had more clay, 
and more sand, but we had about the same amount of silt. Um, so it's not surprising. Again, the coastal plain um, used to be the ocean. And so it's sand deposits while the um, Piedmont was was created through the degradation of the Appalachian Mountains, creating this clay, more clay layer. We found um, electrical conductivity um, to be significantly different between the um, between the two sites within soil strata. So if you look here, um, we have electrical conductivity levels here on the y-axis and the x-axis. We have our zero to 15 centimeter soil samples that we took and 15 to 30 centimeter deep soil samples that we took. And the green is the Piedmont and the brown is the coastal plain. So we um, saw a significant difference where there was a significantly more electrical conductivity in the um, uh, Piedmont soils than there were in the coastal plain soils at both soil, um, soil depths. Uh, electrical conductivity, it's a, it's a measure of soil salinity and it can um, indicate soil texture and nutrient and water availability. So soils become saline through the weathering of rock and minerals. So you would expect that we would have more electrical conductivity at the um, Piedmont site because of the weathering of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and then um, also from a lack of water flushing salts. So if this was an arid environment, which it's not, then they would, um, the salts would just accumulate at the top of the, of the soil strata. But because it rains so much, it water, the, the salt is penetrates the ground, goes through below the root zone and out into the groundwater and into rivers and streams, and then finally out into the ocean. Um, so both of these sites are considered um, no, low, very low salinity and not saline soils. However, if we're comparing the two sites, we can see that, um, that the Piedmont has more electrical conductivity than the coastal plain, um, which um, um, because electrical conductivity is also affected by management practices, we're going to see over time whether or not if this this um, comparison changes, because we'll be able to look at that with the different um, tillage practices that we did. Um, let's see. So it is important to have some electrical conductivity in the soil. You don't want too much soil, too much salt in the soil because it will um, kill your plants. Your plants won't be happy. However, electric conductivity it has will create a net brings negative ions. Um, and so um, they attract positive cations. And so some of those cations are your soil nutrients like sodium and ammonium and potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, aluminum. Um, so there's a lot of soil nutrients that really need to have, um, you need to have elect some amount of electrical conductivity in order to attract that. Um, so uh, so that's, that's what we have there for electrical conductivity. We also got pH, which um, my t-test showed that pH was also significantly different between the Piedmont and the coastal plain at both of the soil strata. Um, our Georgia, the coastal, the Piedmont um, pH averaged 7.8, which is really slightly low for clay soils. And um, the Clemson site was at 7.2, which is slightly high for, for sandy soils. Um, the ideal pH for vegetation is about 6.5. Um, at less than six, you'll have deficiencies in calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and if it's more than seven, then you're going to have nutrients that are unavailable like iron and magnesium, zinc and copper and boron. So because both of ours are a little bit higher than, um, seven, than seven, we had to take that into account when we were um, putting our nutrients on the soil and um, into consideration when we're analyzing our data. We took phosphorus um, and 
Uh, this time, the, the coastal plain had more phosphorus, significantly more phosphorus than the Piedmont soils at both soil depths. Um, phosphorus, as most of you know, it's vital to plant growth and it's found in all living cells. Um, it's, it's important for energy transfer and photosynthesis and transferring sugars and starches. Um, into, and it helps with nutrient movement within the plant. So uh, most crops uh, do their best yield around 40 to 60 parts per million um, of soil phosphorus. And so um, we were low, this, um, this, um, this here is, is equivalent to parts per, per million. And we were low in the coastal, in, in the Piedmont. Um, so again, we had to consider that when we were adding nutrients to, um, to our project over time. We looked at potentially mineralizable nitrogen in um, at zero to 15 centimeter soil depth in both communities and found that there was significantly more potentially mineralizable nitrogen in the Georgia soils um, where they're Piedmont soils than in the coastal plain soils. Um, so potential mineralizable nitrogen, it comes from microbial biomass, dead plant material, dead animal material and tissues. Um, it really represents the fraction of nitrogen that's easily decomposable by the soil microorganisms. And it's an indirect measure of nitrogen availability during the crop growing season. So the more potentially mineralizable nitrogen, the more um, available nitrogen that will, the more nitrogen that will become available to your crop throughout the season. So things like continuous tillage um, without um, adding organic matter tends to deplete um, potentially mineralizable nitrogen and other nitrogen reserves. And then conversely, un, um, reduced till or no till while adding manure and cover crop residue can increase these um, the potentially mineralizable nitrogen and other nitrogen sources. So again, over time, we would expect to see in these different plots Plots, um, based on the amount of tillage um, and, or the lack of tillage, we would expect to see these numbers change over time. And we looked at nitrate, um, which most it's the most accessible, most plant accessible, and it also is most um, susceptible to leaching in the ground. And we saw that um, in the Piedmont soils, there were um, significantly more nitrate at each of the soil depths than um, in the coastal plain. So again, it just, for the most part, the, the soils in the Piedmont are tending to be more friendly to plants growing because there just is more nutrients available, new, more nutrients that will become available over time through the um, process, through, through the season. And we also looked at active carbon. Um, you can't really compare active carbon across sites because it's very dependent on um, management type, on climate, on history of the soil. Um, so really this value is very, is, it's gonna be very useful in measuring, um, in measuring the increases in soil health over time, especially across these three years, because it, it is a very quick responder to soil health conditions uh, that indicates um, changes in soil health. So um, we saw that there was um, a lot of active carbon in the zero to 15 centimeter soil depth in the, in the Piedmont site and not as much in the coastal plain. And there was a significant difference between, in the Piedmont site between the 0, 0,15 and the 15 and 30. So it'll be interesting over time to see how those measurements change in comparing and, and we'll compare site, each, each site to itself and the past measurements um, from there.
So the work to date, um, we've done a lot, of, a lot of stuff um, so far in this first year. We had our first cover crop and manure treatments in winter of 2020. In order to break the field, we did, we did lightly till the whole, all of the plots, and then we um, deep, uh, deep plowed and tilled the conventional plots. We collected in the spring of 2021 before the uh, samples, um, before we terminated the cover crops, we collected a zero to 15 centimeter soil samples, cover crop biomass. We roller crimped those plots that were going to be, um, that were the, con the conservation tillage plots and left the residue on top. And we incorporated the residue into the conventional tillage plots. We planted tomatoes in the spring of 2021, harvested them in the summer of 2021. We got um, marketable and non-marketable yield. We then um, prepared the plots by doing strip till and conventional till for cucumbers, which we planted in the fall of 2021. Um, after the cucumbers were terminated, we took zero to 15 centimeter soil samples, um, again, for analysis in fall of 2021. And then in the winter of 2021, we added our, we installed our cover crop treatments and manure treatments again. Um, just the same one, same design as we did in the winter of 2020. So I have some preliminary results that um, that we can share with you just to kind of show you a little bit, give you some insight into some of the things that we've learned um, while we were doing this project. We have cover crop biomass. Uh, if you look at this chart, the brown bars are the coastal plain and the green bars are the Piedmont. And in the y-axis, the this is rye only, vetch only, rye and vetch mixed, and then this is the control. So obviously there is nothing there because we did not plant anything in there. And this section here is has no organic matter that so no manure added. Um, and then over here we have the rye vetch and rye and vetch combo with the manure added, and it's the same. Um, same way down here, it's same, same pattern with the Piedmont. Um, what we found, I think that was most important here was that we did not get enough biomass. Um, in order to have biomass that is going to really help with effective weed control, you really want it to be over 4,000 pounds per acre. You want there to be, um, you want it to get into, you know, even into like the six and 8,000 pounds per acre. So we were really limited in the amount of biomass that we got from our cover crops. <coughs> so this year, we um, decided to double the amount of our seeding rate. So instead of in the first year, we planted 60 pounds per acre of rye, 15 pounds per acre of vetch in the rye and vetch plots only respectively, and then 30 and um, eight pounds of rye and vetch respectively in the combination plots. And um, so we just, we doubled that so that we could get more um, cover crop. And we also, more biomass out of our cover crop. And we're also planning on terminating our cover crop late, um, later than we did during the first round of, um, of cover crop termination. We, um, in the first round, we, you know, we had tomatoes and we had cucumbers. And something we really learned is, just is the difference between the climates in the, the coastal plain in and us here in the Piedmont in the sense that especially in South Carolina versus Georgia because they really have a very solid two weeks more on either end they have one week um of where their frost and their frost eight ends uh, one week early in the spring, earlier than us, and it starts one week earlier, um, later than us in the fall. And so we really, it was a struggle to try to keep up with managing the project with both the tomatoes and the cucumbers. 
Um, and so we had to terminate the crop, the cover crop a little bit earlier than we would have liked. And so what we learned from this was we're going to next year do one, um, we're just doing sweet corn so that we can have well, this year, we're gonna do sweet corn. So um, we just have one crop giving us more flexibility on either side for, um, for management and rain and whatever issues that come up so that we can actually have our cover crops go, go to the full maturity that they need to in order to provide the most benefit for the soil. Um, so we, the, that's our lesson here. Um, and we're gonna take it and, and go with that for, for this season. We got some, um, marketable yield. We took yield just from the middle rows. So it may not look like there's a lot there, but um, we only do it from the middle rows because if you imagine it's an 18 by 20 foot plot. And so there's a lot of possible differences on the edges, right? Like they aren't getting as much, they might not get as much water or they might get, um, the tillage is a little bit different than right in the center of the plot. Um, maybe the, the manure didn't get spread all the way to those edges. So in order to really get what the treatment is giving the plants, we collect just from the middle rows. Um, and what we found, and again, the, in this graph, the coastal plain is um, on the top in the brown bars and the Piedmont um, marketable yield is at the bottom in the green bars. And you have rye are the darkest brown, vetch only the next darkest, rye and vetch combo, the, um, the, the, the third darkest, and then the, the um, um, control plots are the lightest. And it's the same pattern here with the Piedmont going from dark to light with the rye, the vetch, rye vetch, and, um, and control. And then this, the con CS is for conservation block. And it's divided between the, or those without manure, those with manure, and then the conventional block, those without manure and those with manure. And it's the same pattern down here for the Piedmont. So what we found was it would appear as if there's a trend in having more, um, more yield where there is the conventional tillage plots. We, weren't, um, we haven't really crunched the data to have really thorough analyses on this quite yet. So it's, it's possible that some of these statistics are not, um, that, that when we do the statistics on it, that this is not significantly different. But even if it is, and um, it's a significantly more yield in the conventional plots versus the conservation plots um, in the um, coastal plain sites, that, that wouldn't be unexpected because tillage does tend to, they were, that site was, had the lower nutrient levels, um, it had less available active carbon, it had um, less available um, potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And so when you till, that breaks that up and it makes those things more available. So it, so while you might get your first hit of that being available from what was in the soil, it over time, you will see your numbers decrease because that those nutrients are now leaving the soil where it, when you are adding a cover crop and you're not tilling, you those nutrients may not be available yet, but over time it will build up and be stable and you will be, have more and more of those nutrients. So you can see a switch over time is what we would expect. But also as a farmer, it's not really, yield isn't what's important to farmers, it's profitability. So if you get a little bit less yield, but you, end, you have to really look at the amount of time it took for you to manage the weeds, for you to um, run your tractor over and do all that tilling, for the cost of the fertilizer that you have to add because your, your nutrient levels are lowering um, every time that you till the ground. Um, so the whole package 
is really what will result in your profits. So while maybe it is a little bit less this year, it was a little bit less in yield, we spent less on those plots um, just to install them and manage them and work them than we would have, um, than we did the, the conventional plots. Um, and in the Piedmont, it's really kind of all over the place. I don't think there's um, really a good pattern that we can see here um, with marketable yield quite yet. And again, that was because there was a lot of available nutrients that were just there already. Now, this is the unmarketable yield. Um, again, we had three major rain events that came through um, and it was a really wet season. And um, we did not have enough cover crop, enough biomass in our cover crop. So in those plots that were conventional or conservation tilled, they were they had a lot of weeds because um, that was just part of the research project that we let the the cover crop manage the weeds in those plots. And um, so there was a lot of weeds. And I I will expect to see changes in unmarketable yield um, next year based on. Uh, based on a better management of our biomass from our cover crop. Most of us in the, at the Southeast Organic Center in the Piedmont, we had, um, we just had fungal disease run through our tomatoes. It was pretty prevalent. Um, something I find interesting here is that the cover or the um, control plots tended to have the most um, uh, unmarketable yield, which is interesting because there was, no cover there and the control plots were weeded hand weeded so um either way they they tended to have the most most uh, fungal disease so this is what we learned so far um that we need to increase the cover crop and seeding rate uh the cover crop seeding rate which we have done um and we will see the results of that in the spring uh, tomato yields are trending towards higher and conventional tillage, but further analysis is needed and time is needed to, to really see um, th these are farming projects, but these are eco ecological projects. What we're doing is learning how to work with the, eco the natural ecology of the system in a way to be able to get them the most bang for our buck. And uh, ecology takes time. It takes time to change. Um, so we have to give it that. And then stay tuned for impacts on soil and car on soil carbon and soil health and nitrogen cycling. Um, we will get to that, uh, but we we just need time to analyze data and gather more data. Um, I am going to open it up to questions here in just a second, but before I do that, I would like to let's see where is my notes. I would like to invite everyone to visit our virtual campus online on, at the Rodale Institute website for, um, we have a, a ton of webinars and informational um, pieces online that you can visit and see and use for yourself. So please come and, and look at what we have available and learn, learn from our successes and failures. Um, we have a consulting team that is across the United States. We have people who are, have expertise in organic um, transitioning and helping with the paperwork on a transitioning to organic um, agriculture. We have folks who are experts, animal experts, animal husbandry experts, and small market garden experts and grain experts. So we have a wide variety of people and it is growing. The program is growing very rapidly. So please visit the consulting website so that you can see how we can help you um, with your farming needs. And then also please check the science page um, for up-to-date findings. We have fact sheets and information and um, a lot of our reports and papers that we publish are online. Um, so come and learn from us and what we've been doing there virtually. All right, we have about 16 minutes left. So I am going to open this up to um, the question and answer session, which I am new to. So please 
be patient. Um, so the first question was the pH looks almost the same for both sites. Is that right? And I agree. Um, so the error bars looked like they were exactly the same. Uh, when I did the T test, it said they were significantly different. And I, I will admit that I was working on my presentation late into the night. And so I, um, I need to look into that further to see what happens. There is some uh, weird statistical phenomena that can make that happen where you will have overlapping error bars, but still significant data, um, significantly different data, but um, they are very close um, either way. Um, so I, I just need to look further into it before I can give a better answer. Um, let's see. Oh, they said, never mind. Well, there, I spilled my, my dirty laundry. Um, let's see, do you or will you add organic fertilizer inputs as you go along and what are they? So yes, we do add organic fertilizer inputs. Um, it, it, it really has depended, the, what we do is look at it as a whole and um, we decide what we're going to put in based on what the soil analysis is saying in that moment. Um, and we just try to bring it up to what would be reasonable for that crop for a crop. Um, and so the each site does have a little bit different organic fertilizer added to it. Um, and in terms of what they are, um, you send send me an email and I will connect you with our farm manager. I am a trained ecologist and still learning the farming, the all the different farming ways. And so I lean heavily on our farm manager who, who purchased our um, our organic fertilizers and he can tell you the brand and what it is that we used exactly. Um, do you transplant or direct seed? It depends on what the um, what it is. So the tomatoes we transplanted, we grew seeds in the seedlings in the greenhouse um, and then transplanted them into the field. The cucumbers we direct seeded. So it really just depends on what is the, we try to do whatever is the um, usual farming practice when we're planting our plants. Um, let's see, in both regions, soils are usually quite acidic. Why are the pHs on both sides above seven to start with? Um, well, that is, it's past practices. Um, there was liming. I don't know what the past practices are in the, at the Clemson site in the coastal plain. Um, they, you know, they've, they, it is an organically certified property, but they've, um, they've been farming and doing research there for years. So something about the historical um, uh, techniques that they've used and inputs they've used have changed the, the, um, the acidity level. And um, on our site, it used to be a pine forest and then they limed the site. So after they removed the pine around six years ago, um, and so that's probably led to some of that being a little bit more basic. So why only tomatoes? Are you planning to do trials for more vegetables, grains in the future? So this is just one project that we're doing. We are going to, we just got started with, this is our first project and we will be doing experiments on lots of different stuff into the future. Um, we plan on doing more cover crop research and other vegetable research. Um, so in time, yes, we are going to be doing that. We are, um, you know, potentially doing stuff with cotton. Um, and so we just used this particular experiment. You can't, for an experiment, you really have to try to, your best to keep it as simple as possible. So you're getting your results. There, there's so, so you're, you can, you can, trust in your results. Um, but we had tomatoes and then we had cucumbers in the fall. And then this summer we're going to do corn. So we're just trying to keep it one crop at a time just to keep to minimize changes that the crops may be bringing. Um, let's see, can you share specific dates for cover crop seeding, termination and crop planting? Um, let's see, off the top of my head, we planted the cover crops in mid-November. 
and um, terminated them in mid-April, but this year we're gonna terminate them in mid-May because we feel like that's going to be better. However, for um, the Clemson site in the coastal plain, they also, they, 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 um, they put their cover crop in one week earlier than us, um, but they were at full maturity by the time when, and we terminated at the same time. So um, they, you know, again, it's that, that just the, those two weeks um, different in the frost date um, really impacted that. And then crop planting, um, we planted the tomatoes, right after we terminated. Um, so the tomatoes were planted in early March and the um, cucumbers were planted in, I believe it was early August, but I'd have to um, look back at my notes to get the exact date on that. Since the pH was not ideal for either at the beginning, was anything done to adjust the pH organically? And if not, would that be a potential limiting factor in the initial yields? Um, we didn't. Um, we didn't change anything. Uh, and so, yeah, it can be, and it can be a potential limiting factor. Um, the the way these research projects work, um, you. It's really relative yield that's important um, because every plot is going to be, you know, if we did this project here and then we go do it even just down the road, still in the Piedmont, we will get slightly different values. And so the relative yield across the different, um, the eight different treatments is really what you want to focus on um, as opposed to like total yield where, you know, you might think, oh, well, I would have, you know, I didn't do any of that and I would have gotten way more tomatoes than they got, you know, so what's up with that? And it's because it is an experiment and we're trying to limit the amount we change the soil um, prior to doing the work so that we can see what, what does happen with it. So again, it's, um, it's relative yield. So um, it is possible that it's changed it and we'll just see how the pH changes over time. And if that does influence yield. So tomatoes, corn, and cukes are all summer crops. What about earlier spring crops, which necessitates an earlier termination of cover crops? Um, well, in this particular project, because cover crops are the focus of the research, really more than the um, vegetables and the impacts that the cover crops have on the soil and then therefore the vegetables, we want to focus on getting the cover crops um, terminated when it is as at proper maturity. Um, and so in, in the case, if the, if, if I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but if the question is, what do you want to do if you have a spring crop and you need to terminate earlier, then, um, you would, could pick different cover crops that would terminate earlier. You could, um, plant cover crops earlier in the fall so that it will, um, you can terminate them. So they're more mature in the spring and then they, they ramp up faster. Um, and um, you can also in the fall, you can try, some people have had shown success where they have their fall crop and then they broadcast their cover crop. Even though their fall crop is going late, they broadcast their cover crop in before they terminate their fall crop so that the cover crop is already going before they terminate. And once they terminate, it's, it is more mature than it would be if it, they had waited to termination. Um, so let's see, another question. We have six more minutes. So with the three-year research cycle, you won't be able to see the cumulative effects of the management on tomatoes, correct? So we're not gonna, have tomatoes likely again. So it's going to be the cumulative effect of um, yield per that plant over, you know, per that crop, whatever the, those crops are. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. So whatever those crops are over time, um, but again, three years is, is not a lot. Um, but the idea is 
the focus is what the cover crop is doing in the soil. And then yes, we will see the results in also the plant, the, veg the vegetables as well. So, um, so yeah, three years is, is a quick turnaround. And that's, you know, so the, that's what in the beginning when I had mentioned, this is really for what you can do in the immediate future. And, and um, uh, because there are long-term impacts that if we stayed and did this, continued this project for 20 years, um, we may find different results. And that's just, that's just the way the ecological system works. Uh, let's see, you have a rotation that won't plant them in that same area again. So yes, I, I think I answered that. So we're not going to be planting tomatoes in um, that in those plots again. It's going to be corn this year. Um, any irrigation or strictly at the mercy of the weather? So yes, we had strip irrigation that we installed. Um, it was drip, ir excuse me, drip irrigation that we installed with um, drip tape and um, uh, and we irrigated as needed um, the way we had the plot, the blocks set up because our site at the Southeast Organic Center in the Piedmont is on a slope. We had our block set up in a way that we could irrigate each block based on the need. Um, so we just irrigated as, as needed. So we have four more minutes. Does anyone else have any questions? Let's see. Okay. So I'm 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 technically breaking the rules and because we do have a few more minutes. I looked in the chat and I did see one question. Um, but in your trials, did you observe that the inconsistent rainfall last season affected the prevalence of fungal pathogens in your tomato crop? If so, do you expect the increase? And severe weather events to have an effect on eastern U.S. crop yield in the future. Um, well, so we did not collect data for me to be able to say to say scientifically what happened, um, but I can say anecdotally that yes, I do believe that the rain patterns created a lot of fung fungus in our in our tomatoes. And in fact, because we were picking non-marketable as well as marketable, um, there was a point where we were going through and almost everything was non-marketable for, um, uh, for a picket or two, you know, where there was significantly more non-marketable than marketable. But then once those weird rains passed, there was a period of time where it felt like we almost had no fungal pathogens in the field and we had a lot of marketable tomatoes. So, so yes, um, anecdotally, I would say that is that it did impact that. And um, if we do have more severe weather events due to climate change and more rain due to climate change, then um, I think that uh, if you're trying to grow tomatoes, then yes, it probably will impact um, crop yield in the future. Um, I think that, you know, in regards to that and changing climatic patterns, um, farmers really need to, um, farmers really need to, um, uh, think about how, you know, try to try to kind of work through what, what, what are the, the vegetables that people grow that are in slightly warmer, more wet climates or drier, more cold climates, because it's going to be different in different areas. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that there's going to definitely be a shift in where things are growing and how well they grow in each region. It's, it's, it, farming will have to change with the weather patterns. All right, I have one more minute. And, um, oh, 
a friend is getting 40% better yield in hoop houses and in the field, in the Philadelphia area. Yeah, hoop houses, they're great. Um, we are still new and building our infrastructure. Um, we have an equipped grant um, in right now, hoping to get our first hoop house. And um, once we start, once we build up our in, um, and have more hoop houses, we'll be doing more hoop house experiments. Um, here, it is definitely, um, a, you know, it's a season extender um, here because you can, you can, uh, you know, you can just grow more in d further into the fall and you can grow earlier in the spring. Um, so, so yeah, hoop houses are great. All right, I see it is three o'clock and I have answered all the questions that are in the Q&A and the one that was in the chat. So, um, Please again, everyone visit our virtual campus, our consulting team's website and our science team's website. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at Christy Wendelberger at rodaleinstitute.org. Um, and I look forward to sharing with you some of these, um, some more of our results in the future. All right, thank you.